Hey guys, welcome to this week's show. This week we are looking at millennial millionaires. Millennials are a very interesting generation and contrary to popular belief, have had their fair share of setbacks and experiential learnings. That said, it's also been a great time for making money. What you're gonna hear are some of the milestone accomplishments within that generation, but more importantly, some of the challenges they too have had to face. And these aren't unusual for anybody in their journey towards winning the game of money. Make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurential. Good to be here, Mr. Baxter. We're gonna have a bit of fun with today's episode. A bit of an interesting one and maybe some controversy in this as well. And we're gonna be talking about the millennial millionaires, mm-hmm. a specific age group that have actually done quite well, but not all that it seems. Indeed, and <laughs> this will be an interesting one. I mean, we cross generations, uh, certainly age-wise, and, and this one will be a revelation, I think, because there's, I think, a lot of perception about what millennials are and where their wealth has come from, which when you sort of dig in a little bit deeper, is a bit of a mistruth. So this will be quite an interesting one to unpack. So let's start, let's define our millennials. So millennials, they are born between 1981 and 1997. So as of right now, they would be between the ages of 27 to 42. Mm. And that's a really interesting point in time when you look at not the physical age, but the financial maturity age. Uh, And one of the things that we've covered in our book, Wealth Playbook, is is very much the journey that people go on based on their chronological age as to where benchmarks maybe should sit or call to action should be. So for example, you know, where should you get into the property market at what age? Yeah, and we talk about the idea of doing that before at least 25, so 23 to 24, 25 is kind of the idea or the ideal age to, to, to get started in the property market, which for anyone that's uh, looking at this that's not in the property market right now, it seems like a real big stretch to be able to do that as it does for every generation. So let's explore a little bit about where the millennials have gone. And I think if you break that back over time, millennials as they were starting to come through that sort of money coming of age, 23, 24, um, you're around about 2000. That's right. Uh, and so for memory, interest rates back then would have been probably about five and a half percent. Yeah, I think five, would that ca- be about right? Yeah, cash rate was around 5% early 2000, which means banks would have been loaning out at probably eight or nine, I would guess. So higher than, than where we're at right now. And, and the notion that we're in a situation of high interest rates making it very difficult to afford anything is is actually not the case uh, when you compare it to you know, the history like 2000. Five and a half borrowing rates, seven eight percent, pretty expensive time to be borrowing money to get into property. But that said, you know that period for Australia for and I moved here in 1999. That period was a real golden time in Australia because we had the Sydney Olympics in 2000. Um, Australia was very much as it always has been, I suppose, but that really did push us front and center on the global stage and 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 really saw the start of a really significant boom in property through that period of time uh, i remember buying my first first purchase here in australia would have been i think 2000 uh, so i've been here for about seven or eight months working it out and and then got stuck into the market because why would you rent when you should be buying uh and uh, and off you go and you know for that period of time for 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 millennials that was a hassle on time i think what we've got to do though when we talk about our millennials is split them into two camps if we can. And then we've got early millennials and then later millennials, if we can use that as a definition. So closer born to 1980 versus those born closer to 2000. Yeah. So if we look at interest rates for a moment's time, maybe as you mentioned, you could argue on the basis that interest rates be much higher than where they are, for example, now, that you would have had to work a lot harder and Mm. build up that earning capacity to service a mortgage. Don't forget, though, 2008 came along, we had the GFC. Well, that's right. And I think, you know, just as a, a general point of note, Australian property was relatively cheap. And I remember, you know, I guess anything moving from London is cheap. But, you know, Australia <laughs> was a, 99, 2000 was, was a, it felt like a really low cost country. Uh, to live in, in so far as, as I say, yes, I admit, coming from London, it was a bit different. But yeah, you go out for for for, for food, for example, uh, w- was relatively cheap. So the cost of living in general appeared and felt cheaper then. So for those guys that got stuck in, that was a real golden era uh, for uh, for getting started. You had that momentum post Olympics, great boost to the economy, and a great boost to the wealth of of people that had the gumption uh, to to get started and get in. And of course, the music changed with the GFC. You know, look at those sort of 2007 to 2010. Uh, suddenly, you're in a very tumultuous situation uh, within the economy where, you know, 
you're seeing a, a global crisis within banking and finance, bad debts. A lot of companies you know, went to the wall through that period of time. Um, there was some choppiness in, in interest rates too, a lot of uncertainty, you know, weakness in the property markets. All of a sudden, those good moves made in the early 2000s you began to question uh, until we then came out the other side of it again. And I think you know, the big advantage for the older group of baby boomers is that that mental resilience that's come from seeing a really good time uh, and opportunistic times to make money, and then equally seeing the other side of the coin, the difficulty of the GFC. You know, were it not, of course, for the mining boom, you know, the Australian economy would have been in tatters like the US, but we had that relationship with China that was starting to expand uh, and raw material export, which pulled us out of that GFC. And we then started into that next phase of lower interest rate growth, uh, which, uh, which was uh, an, another time uh, of really a golden era, I think, from the GFC right the way through to 2020. Well, that's right. I mean, we saw rate cuts, right? Interest yeah. rates went from about 9% on the cash rate to basically zero mm. in that 10-year period. So as a wealth source, a wealth yeah. creator, any of those mid to late millennials, as you say, you bought property in an interest rate cutting cycle, yeah. economic expansion, happy days. That's right. So the guys who got started early, had a good run, gave a little bit back and then had a great run, but also had maybe a decade more experience in markets and maybe have used that uh, to, to parlay into several properties, for example. We're only talking about property here. We could talk about the stock market in just the same way. The latter millennials got their first chance of getting a start post-GFC. And again, as you say, in that cutting environment, a great time to be piling into the property market. I guess some people didn't because maybe they had an eye on, oh, gee, the GFC didn't look much fun. Maybe that's a sign of what we've we've got to come. And I guess that points out a, a, a real money conversation that people have where they talk themselves out of opportunities by fearing the worst. Uh, you know, we always talk about expect the best, fear the worst, the ball's going to drop somewhere in between. If you're prepared, you'll be fine. And for those people that then got into that second wave, they've done exceptionally well, albeit until we hit the COVID correction and lockdown in 2020, which again, you know, was a very, well, it was a unique set of circumstances where the world literally was, was locked behind a door. That's right. And then since COVID, we know rampant inflation and interest rates have gone from basically zero to where they are now. When we look at the the earlier millennials, AB, would you say on that basis that they may not have got started as early and they've had to face the challenges like COVID and now an interest rate hiking cycle that they maybe haven't done as well? Yeah, they would have been at a, a distinct disadvantage in terms of timing wise. And look, you can't help the year you were born in. Um, yeah, in just the same way, it's funny you sort of talk about you know, how luck and things can influence. Um, yeah, one of my one of my favorite authors back in the day was Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, who's written some incredible work. He's a sort of economic social commentator. Uh, and one of the things that they noticed was that depending on the month of birth would depend on your success in the National Hockey League in the US. So a, a little bit of a Crazy. random point. But, you know, given if you're, if, you, if you're at the right age through the school cycle, you tend to be big for your year. And if you're bigger in a contact sport, well, I suppose ice hockey is a, a contact sport to an extent, um, you're likely to fare a little better and you're likely to get better coaching because you're in the better team. And that's going to be your platform to move forward into the professional league. It's, it's, it, it's a really interesting statistical thing to look at. And in just the same way within the millennial group, looking at the opportunity based on year of birth just within that one generation, certainly... Uh, there were some quite different opportunities that presented them. Uh, and I guess one of the things that we see and we're starting to hear mentioned you know, in, in the press in particular, and actually before I dive into that, you know, so millennials, I think, have, uh, have had a really opportunity at the time, but they've had to work hard for it. And I think they've been able to generate a lot of well-rounded skills through good and more challenging times as a generation, whether early or later millennials, be it through the COVID challenge or whether it was a GFC, they've both groups have had, had those challenges to go through. But they're quite well placed in terms of personal wealth creation because they've done it for themselves, and whether that be in property, whether it be in the stock market, whether it be uh, embracing um, crypto. Uh, you know, it's been something that's well represented across that particular generation. I think where things have perhaps become a little unfair, and I've read a couple of articles to this effect recently, is this wealth transference that people are looking at now between baby boomers and their wealth being passed on to the next generation. You know, all these millennials are getting an easy run. They're going to inherit all this money. But in actual fact, it's not the millennials themselves that'll be the likely beneficiaries of the boomers. It's actually Gen, Gen Xs, people like me. That's right. 65 to 1979, right? Gen mm. X. So that particular generation is the one 
that, that's likely to see the biggest wealth swing in terms of uh, of inheritance, if it were. And I think you know, baby boomers and Gen Xers have probably been the last two generations of more traditional wealth creation, where um, you know you've there's been an awful lot of emphasis: have a job, work hard at school, get your mortgage paid off, um, own your home, maybe buy a second one, do some travel. Um, whereas the younger groups from millennials forward have always been encouraged to have a slightly different uh, philosophy and be more embracing of new ways of, of, of tackling money making beyond just simply having a job. It's funny you say that because I'm not far off being a millennial and there's a huge revolution in so mm. far as being financially, financially literate. So yeah. fire, financial independence, retire early, that's a term I always hear thrown around and then double income, no kids or dink. Mm. So that millennial age group where you're sort of pushing late 20s, early 30s, rather than looking to settle down, get married, work, retire, are actually taking a much different view on life overall using finances. 100%. You can see the demographic shifts on that with child birth rates and all that sort of stuff too. So there's a there's a, there's a a whole level of empirical evidence to, to kind of support that. But that curiosity of wondering what else is there, and I don't mean in terms of a travel experience, but from an investing point of view, I think it's been a, a huge driver in that millennial group, and I suspect will will we'll continue to be a driver for Gen Y, Gen Z, uh, and everyone passing on behind it. Because once you've opened that door, that there's there's more opportunity there. Um, you know, the, 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 you can't shut the door once you've seen it. You you can't unsee it. So it's a it's a it's a really interesting group. Self driven, got there themselves. Had a little bit of a setback along the way either through GFC or, or through COVID and have come out the other side. Uh, and yes, interest rates being tougher may stop some of those very late um, millennials uh, getting into the property market uh, because of that perspective of you know, property markets are very strong, prices are high, interest rates are high. Well, they are, but interest rates have been higher and it hasn't stopped other people in that generation. Any difference is, I guess, valuation on property has moved up a little bit. So let's talk about technology for a moment's time here because that millennial camp of people would have pretty much had technology freely available to them from, from the beginning. Mm. Technology, when you look at it, you know, you talk about AI, even something as simple as e-commerce or being able to buy shares online, not having to call your dad's broker, for mm. example, has had a huge impact on that age group. Yeah. Positive or negative for the millennials? Look, I think you can only view it as positive because you only know what you know. It's, it, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, instead of instead of having streaming, you've got to go back to CD or worse still video, Oof. you know, uh, worse still in VHS or Betamax. You know, I mean, there's a whole subset of things. Once, once things have moved on, you can't turn the clock back. You know, and it's quite interesting. I was having dinner on Saturday. Uh, uh, one of the people at the dinner was employee number six at WiseTech. So, wow. uh, and has been an investor in that business from day one, and needless to say, has uh, has you know, generated considerable wealth because of that. And a really, really interesting person, very engaging conversation, and 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 I think we were chatting away almost at the expense of it. We just clicked and we're having a great conversation. And I guess the point that we arrived at is, as a generation, we both have one thing in common: that we'd seen the world and lived in a world before the internet. And look, I know the internet has been around a lot, but I'm talking about adoption of. And then we've subsequently seen the world post. And I think there's some advantages to that because it gives you a really distinct perspective of just how good things are now compared to how they perhaps were in the past. Uh, but for millennials, they don't have that distraction. You've seen this is the new norm and it's all of this. And, and it's been a much less, a much more embracing generation i think because there's no oh well, yeah but let's look back because there's nothing to look back to it's always been in this new tech world that's continually moved at a, a very very fast adoption pace and, and doubtless to say that will continue through future generations where you know you definitely don't go back to the antiques of the internet i've got this whatever the, the next thing is going to be ai seems to be that right now in terms of you know the the the, the take-up rate and global impact of something that's going on but from an investment perspective you know, people, I think, unfairly look at the millennials and go, oh, you've just had a dream run because there have been some pretty, pretty, pretty meaty challenges. And don't get me wrong, there's been some some really big decade long windows of opportunity in there. But I think if you go back through every generation, there are those big windows of opportunity. We just sometimes forget them. That's right. And millennials, as you say, 10 years of interest rate cuts, technology available to them and mm. a huge focus on financial literacy has fared well. And they, as yeah. you say, they haven't inherited it. They've but created that, it. That, that whole financial literacy side of things in particular um, is huge. 
And I think sometimes familiarity can lead to contempt insofar as financial literacy portals, you know, we're probably the leading one here in Australia and continue to do that with you know, the Wealth Playbook, our book. The reality is that opportunity is available for everybody, but so few people really plug into it. They just take it for granted. Oh, if I want to learn something, I can, rather than actually learning it. And that's a, that's a big distinction. I think you've got to learn it and then you have to apply it rather than, oh, I can go and learn that if I want to. Why wouldn't you want to learn something that's going to set you up? And, 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 and you know that wealth creation that's gone on in that generation is huge. It's only going to be rivaled by the wealth transference. The challenge for people in my generation, the Gen Xers, is that that level of financial literacy probably isn't as sophisticated as it is for millennials. And so there's a huge message there for Gen Xers to upskill and learn how to steward that inheritance that's coming over the hill. Uh, because easy come, easy go. We're, and I don't think the Gen Xs are a generation that particularly, I speak for myself on this, I suppose, but <laughs> I don't think we're a generation that, that particularly do treat things as easy come, easy go, because there have been some challenges in, 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 in our time in the sun too. Uh, but I do think upskilling to learn how to steward that money is absolutely crucial. Indeed. Last question for you, AB. What's next for millennials in the situation we're in currently? Look, for millennials, um, is that moving away from dual income and no kids to having kids, I think, for, <laughs> for a lot of them if they haven't done that already. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, the enjoyment of the work that's already gone in, we talk a lot about delayed gratification. And if you're an early millennial that got started in the early 2000s, your net worth against your age spectrum is relatively attractive compared to most generations. And as a consequence, enjoying the fruits of that labor uh, that you got started early is something that can be richly deserved. And you know, traveling recently, some of the travel I've done, the majority of it has been boomers. And then some of the people in, in my generation, and then at the other end of the equation, there's probably been um, generation Y, traveling a different part of the plane, resenting the fact that the baby boomers have taken all the nice seats on the plane perhaps. But what I think you're starting to see now is that tap into that millennial money for experience, things like travel. You've done the work, you've had your family or having your family, uh, your assets have worked really well. You've got yourself a really good base to work off. And now is the time to start tapping into that and enjoying some color. And I think that's one of the trends that we might see. Who benefits from that from a business perspective? Like travel jets is the global ETF for air travel. And I think nice. we're embarking on the global age of air travel. You know, we're seeing US passport applications, you know, at record highs right now for that, that to be going on. Um, and other industries that are perhaps associated with that. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting to see everyone have their, their, their bit of time and everyone's got a drum to bang. Oh, it was really hard for me. And it was so easy for you. But, you know, as I say, millennials have been through their shares of skirmishes too with GFC and COVID. So they've got a few battle scars and, if you haven't been swallowed up by those battles, then the learning experience that has come out of it and what it's enabled you to do post that is key and critical and has probably propelled wealth forward. Uh, and I hope people are in that camp. Of course, if they're not, if they're in that generation and they haven't been able to, to get started, probably the biggest handbrake on getting started is not knowing what to do. And again, shameless plug, get a copy of our book, Wealth Playbook. It's going to give you a game plan that's going to really help you at whatever stage in life you are to get started or maybe unlearn some of the beliefs that you might have that aren't serving you well and, and get moving forward. Indeed. Interesting age group, but as you say, the land of opportunity for the millennial millionaires. Thanks very much, AB. My pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.